Do you remember back in 2008 the term too big to fail? It was used for SIFIs, systemically important financial institutions, because if one failed, then it threatened to take down the entire global economy. So, 2010, they created the Dodd-Frank Act, and that was supposed to eliminate the too big to fail. The interesting part about that is what just recently has happened and continues to happen in the repo markets, because what they've been showing us is that in no uncertain terms, those that were too big to fail are even bigger now and an even bigger threat to the global financial system. So in today's headline news commentary, I'm going to update you on what's going on in those repo markets. And I'll also explain to you what you can do to protect your wealth and assets before it becomes obvious to everybody and those too big to fails take us all down. Because it's not really a matter of if, it's a matter of when. All that and more coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you survive and thrive the crisis that is not yet apparent to everybody, only to those of us that are actually paying attention. And in today's headline news, really, I could spend the whole time just in one area, but in the Wall Street Journal, and all of the links are on our blog, by the way, no fix for the money markets. A study recently published by the Biz, Bank for International Settlements, points out that liquidity in the repo market rests in the hands of the four largest U.S. banks. We've talked about that. So there you go. The too big to fail are even bigger. And the SIFI market, now, mind you, I didn't count this this morning, and it's certainly bigger than four. But instead of the repo market being spread amongst a number of banks, it is now concentrated in four. And I'd say that that could just take everything down with us. You know, you can form your own opinion. But take a look at the everything is just rosy and hunky-dory the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. This is all, by the way, as of December 25th. From uh, This one is from June, but the rest of these are well, they're basically from the same time frame. The, all of these balance sheets started moving up, as you know, in September. And you can see how much they've grown. And to think that none of this has any impact is ridiculous. Because what do we see? I'm coming back to this in a second. But the NASDAQ hits a new high. It's over 9,000. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Because the other piece that I want to talk to you about on this sheet, I mean, there was a lot just on this one page. U.S. government sets a record for debt auctions. Of course, trying to spend their way out of too much debt by taking on more debt. But this is the piece that's in, that is incredibly important because, you know, I always talk about the risk transfer from the few, from the banks, from the elites, to the insiders, to the many, to the public. And a lot of the tools that they use are when people make those deposits into their 401ks or their IRAs, they buy mutual funds, etc., to institutional investors, those that are investing your money. So in this article, the U.S. government, with maturities ranging from 2 to 30 years, uh, they, they issued a 26% increase in debt from 2017 in 2019. The share of the debt purchased by investors, those are those institutional investors that are investing your money, 
was the largest since the government began releasing auction data. Bond dealers, so we're talking about banks and investment firms, purchased the smallest share of debt since data became available. That is transferring the risk. They've got to issue this debt. They're spending it like crazy. And this is how they create more money in the system. We've already heard how Fed Chair Powell said they're going to let inflation run a little hot, which I think is interesting when you stop to consider that presumably they haven't even been able to hit that 2% target. But we're coming back to the NASDAQ piece here because I'm going to show you gold and silver's response. And then we're going to take a look at the markets briefly. This top chart is on the spot silver market. And you can see where I have the lines drawn. Remember, this is support. And when it breaks above, like over here, it becomes support. And this is resistance. And I think it's really interesting for anybody. It's easy enough to do this. Print out a chart take a ruler and see where things bounce. And then that will tell you where the support and the resistance is. It is testing it. This is as of, is today the 27th? No, this is as of the 27th. What is today? I don't even remember. Uh, the 30th. The 30th. So if it breaks above this, then it's going higher. Otherwise, it might stay inside of this range. And the same thing is true for spot gold. This, does, this reflects the current market value, what Wall Street has determined you should think that its value is, not the fundamental value, its true value for its most important function. But you can see how they are both testing a resistance level. Let's see if they break through that, which is highly probable. In fact, it may have happened today. Then they're both going higher. But I ran a relative performance chart. This is a perf chart. And I looked at spot gold, the Dow, so stocks, the 10-year note price, treasury note price, and silver. And I went back 370 days, so you could say a year. Interestingly enough, spot gold outperformed everything else. The stock market was second, but the silver, spot silver, wasn't too far behind that. The price on the treasuries was the worst performer of the four that I looked at. But spot gold, boy, you don't really hear them saying that too much, do you? That spot gold has outperformed all those other markets. But there's the evidence it has. Even as these markets, again, you've got the NASDAQ, new high, 9,000. Many of them are kissing it. So remember what happened last December? Well, we had one of the worst trading days moving into Christmas. And then right after that, boom, one of the best ones that they've had. They could not have the markets threaten that again this year. And of course, with all the central bank pivots and all that money, you know, that I just showed you going into the system. Remember, when the central banks create new money, it must go someplace. And the first place it goes is into the banks, and then they divvy that out. So in the repo market, it's going to the hedge funds, right? The banks are funding this risky trading behavior. But it goes into stocks, it goes into bonds because all that new liquidity has to go someplace. But what they're also telling you is that leveraging is in an uptrend. Uptrend, that means more leverage, more danger, more debt. Bad news, way overbought and here you go. We've looked at this before. Uh, an RSI or a number above 70, that's what you have to just pay attention to. A number above 70 equals overbought. Everything is severely overbought. It is an accident waiting to happen. But they don't want you to know about it until it's too late to do anything about it. That's why even looking at the spot gold and silver charts, it's 
a gift. It's a bargain. And that is really pretty simple because going into 2020, what do we have? Goldman is concerned about share buybacks. The stock buybacks this year, 2019, declined by 15%. But what's that? the stock buybacks have been a huge factor in keeping these markets floating. The demand created by buybacks has outpaced demand from other sources, such as mutual funds since 2011, giving repurchases increased importance in the U.S. markets. So what happens if these corporations stop buying back their stocks? I mean, they got a windfall with the, with the President Trump tax changes, and that carried them through, but they're already pulling back and their earnings per share has definitely been declining. We've gone into basically an earnings recession. Doesn't look like that because when a corporation buys back their stock, there are fewer shares out there. So it looks like the earnings per share has grown, but the earnings per share has not grown and a significant significant decline in buybacks would dramatically shift the supply demand structure for U.S. equities. So moving into 2020, what is going to support these markets? Really good question, because this goes to the repo, the problems in the repo market, that lack of liquidity, meaning that the money's just not there. And what did the government do? Well, you saw all they're injecting all that new money. The problem is, is the more they print, the less value in terms of purchasing power that those dollars have. And I'll show you that um, probably either this week or, or next week so we can look at that some more. But the liquidity is an issue and that's what you're looking at here. This is uh, full compliance to the Volcker, Volcker rule, which means that the trading desks at these different banks have shrunk. And you can see the liquidity going back to 2007, and here it is over here. And the number of middlemen, so the number of market makers that were supporting the markets, well, here we are in 2007, and here we are through 2018. Okay, so there is there are fewer and fewer buyers in the markets. And if Goldman is right and corporations, well, you know, maybe they'll just take on more debt to continue to do it. But there's only there are limits to how much debt can be taken on. Because it's not the investors, it's not the mutual funds that have been supporting these markets or even the ETFs. Now those things have created the herding impact, which is why it's so important to keep the markets floating up, but who's going to support it? In the meantime, Congress, now they did this in May, but it never passed. They changed uh, some over, they did an overhaul of the retirement system, basically by allowing um, smaller corporations to come together in a multi-employer plan, kind of like unions do, but they wouldn't have to have any relation or be in the same industry in order to qualify. They also are promoting annuities, which are very, very expensive. And I know that a lot of people that have 401ks are sitting with annuities in there, but a mutual fund inside of a 401k or a tax deferred IRA or anything like that would do the same thing as an annuity, but an annuity is a lot more expensive. So, however, it didn't pass in May, but they attached this to a must pass spending bill or they were gonna shut down the government. And so it goes into effect on January 1st. I think it's really interesting. Wait, there's a little more on the second page in here. Bear with me for just a minute. So uh, yeah, it protects employers that follow certain procedures from being sued if they select an insurance company to make annuity payments and that insurer later fails to, play, to pay claims. 
Let's think about the negative rates, okay? Because with negative rates, that's a big problem for any, any uh, pensions or insurance companies that have made promises in the future. So that's all we have time for today. I'm really sorry. I hope you guys are, are um, having peaceful and happy holidays. This week we'll do Q&A on Thursday. And then next week we'll be starting off fresh and go back to our regular schedule. If you have any questions about this or anything else, just send them to questions at itmtrading.com. All of the links to all of these articles and the ones that I did not get to today we are on our blog at itmtrading.com forward slash blog. And of course, everything's posted on brighteon.com. If you'd like to talk to one of our strategy specialists and make an appointment, just click that calendar link below to schedule that call. And if for some reason uh, you can't get the time that you want, call us at 888-696-4653 and we'll go ahead and set that up for you at your convenience. So until Thursday, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.